Will you pray with me? Father, as we participate in the Lord's Supper, allow us to recall your provision for us. You have cared for us in such a way that you would send your son to this earth to suffer and die for our sin. You not only sent him to die for our sins, but you also made it so that he would intercede for us through the Holy Spirit so that we would be able to walk in your ways. And at the point of our death, we would be presented before you, holy and blameless. Help us now to put aside all distractions and focus on remembering Jesus, as in his name we pray, amen. If you, uh, if you do not have a Bible, there are men up front that would uh, be happy to provide one for you. Just hold up your hand. Uh, if you do not own a Bible, please feel free to take this one with you. Communion is that part of our service during uh, which we are directed to remember Jesus. How do we know that we are instructed to do this? Paul writes in 1 Corinthians that the Lord Jesus, in the night in which he was betrayed, took bread And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he took the cup also after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Jesus is very specific when he says, Do this in remembrance of me. He used the final Passover meal and the Lord's Supper to remind us about how we are in constant need of remembering him and remembering what he was about to do. The bread and the cup are symbols chosen by the Lord himself to signify and honor his atoning death. It is a priceless reminder of his great love with which he loved us and it reminds us of our dependence on him for everything that we are. One common commentator said, there isn't one ounce of spirituality that we bring to the table. We are utterly bankrupt, and Jesus on the cross, by giving up his body and by shedding his blood, completely satisfied God's requirement and opened up the gates of heaven for anyone who would believe in him. Each time we come to the Lord's table, we are reminded of our dependence on him for our salvation. Not only that, but it also reminds us of our dependence on him for our sanctification. It is such an important aspect of our walk with him. So every time we take the Lord's Supper, we are called to reflect on the benefits we have in Christ, not only for our justification, but for the sanctifying work that he's doing in us. What a privilege we have at this time to remember that Jesus gave his body on the cross and shed his blood, completely satisfying God's requirement as punishment for sin for those who would believe. We are to remember and proclaim again and again that it was our sin that, would ca- that was the cause of Jesus' suffering and death. As a part of our participation in communion this morning uh, and in remembrance of Jesus, let's look at Colossians. Colossians 1, verses 21 and 22. Colossians 1, 21 and 22. And although you were formerly alienated and hostile in mind, engaged in evil deeds, yet he has now reconciled you in his fleshly body through death in order to present you before him holy, blameless, and beyond reproach. This passage basic, first basically describes believers prior to their salvation, formerly alienated and hostile in mind, engaged in evil deeds. And then second what it cost Jesus to save us through his death. And thirdly, how will we look on Judgment Day, 
Holy. <laughs> Holy and blameless and beyond reproach. The key word in these uh, two passages it, as it relates to salvation is the word reconciled. Reconciliation is a change in a sinner's relationship to God. We are reconciled to God when God restores man to a right relationship with him. Reconciliation takes place in two ways. Our attitude toward God changes because he changes it for us. And secondly, God's attitude toward us changes because he no longer sees us as sinners, but he sees his son. Paul in this passage is reminding the Colossians and us of what we were prior to reconciliation. Look at verse 21. They were formerly alienated and hostile in mind, engaged in evil deeds. The word alienated means to be cut off or separated. Prior to reconciliation with God through Christ, we were separated from God. Ephesians 2, 12 and 13 says it this way. Remember that you were at that time separate from Christ, excluded from the commonwealth of Israel, and strangers to the covenant of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. But now in Christ Jesus, you who formerly were far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. All unbelievers suffer separation from God unless they are reconciled to God. And reconciliation is provided only to those who are in Christ. Prior to salvation, we also were hostile in mind, which is the same thing as saying that we were hateful. Our attitude toward God was one of hatred. We resented his holy standards and his commandments, and we were engaged in evil deeds. As unbelievers, we had a willful love for our sin. John 3, 19 and 20 says, This is the judgment, that the light has come into the world, and men love the darkness rather than the light, for their deeds were evil. For everyone who does evil hates the light, and who does not come to the light for fear that his deeds will be exposed. Yet Paul tells us in Colossians 1.22, he has now reconciled you in his fleshly body through death in order to present you before him holy and blameless and beyond reproach. If you are a believer, reconcili reconciliation to God has already taken place. Your heart has been transformed from a hater of God to one who is eternally grateful for sending his son to the cross to die in your place. As a result of believing in Jesus' work on the cross, God now looks upon, looks upon us as being like Jesus, holy, blameless, and beyond reproach, set apart to God by his imputed righteousness. With this imputed righteousness of Jesus who believes which believers received at salvation, we are considered by God to be holy, as he is holy, because we are in Christ. To be blameless and beyond reproach means that no one can bring charge against us. We are blameless because Jesus covered every one of our transgressions, past, present, and future. The Lord's Supper is also a time to examine our devotion to Christ. Please use this time to examine your heart, confess your sin to God, consider going to those you have sinned against and seek their forgiveness, and take steps towards repentance. So how will you remember Jesus during communion? To remember, consider your testimony and the sin that enslaved you. Consider the joy and the peace that came to you when you realized that sin was no longer in control of your life. As believers, we celebrate the Lord's Supper. When we celebrate the Lord's Supper, we are in communion with the risen Christ who indwells us and he, through the Holy Spirit, is spiritually present with his people. 
If you're here today and have not realized the forgiveness of Christ, we are glad that you are with us. We want you to hear the peace and the joy that comes from knowing Jesus. I can assure you there is no greater privilege than to know that your sin is forgiven. And it's forgiven forever and ever. And to know that heaven will be your home when you die. However, if you choose not to repent and believe, the Lord's Supper is not for you. Please allow the bread and the juice is to pass you by. The men will now come in service. Please take communion on your own when you're ready. And I will close this time in prayer. <clears throat>